Hi everyone, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to talk about our work. I'm Suhail, I'm a postdoc at the Oscar Klein Center in Stockholm and will be moving to KICC Cambridge early next year. Today I'll be talking about the Hubble constant with explosive transients, specifically a view from the Zwicky transient facility, some ongoing work. Uh, my collaborators from the IPTF CTF collaborations are listed here, and I'll also be talking about some recently concluded work with the SHOES collaboration. So over the next 20 odd minutes, I'll start by giving a brief motivation for why we want to measure the Hubble constant and what are the different independent distance measures, specifically the ones I'll focus on talking about today. In the first part of my talk, I'll talk about some recently concluded work, mainly centered on systematics in the local distance ladder estimate of H0, specifically looking at a study that we did on the impact of the assumed dark energy properties in the dark, dark energy model in the inferred value of H0 from the distance ladder. And then I'll talk about the first resolved strong field lens type 1 supernova and resolved photometric measurements, as well as inferences on the magnification and extinction. In the second part, I'll talk about ongoing work from this wiki transient facility. So a status update for the year one type 1 supernova Hubble diagram sample and preliminary Hubble diagram results. And finally, I'll talk about the lens supernova search from ZDF briefly and leave you with summary and output. So why do we want to measure the Hubble constant? The Hubble constant sets the absolute distance scale of the universe. Local probes of H0, like the distance ladder or time delay cosmography, give us a direct measurement of the value of the present day expansion rate of the universe. However, we can get an inference of the value of H0 from the early universe by using the sound horizon at decoupling, for example, from the cosmic microwave battery. In order to get a value of H0 from that data, we need to infer it by assuming a cosmological model. And this can then be combined with uh, late universe probes like baryon acoustic oscillations and type 1 supernovae in order to constrain the late time expansion history. And that gives us the value of H0. Now comparing the inferred global value from like CMB with something in the local universe gives us an end-to-end -end test of the background expansion of the model. For example, the standard plan, the CDM scenario. And what has been seen recently in the literature is that with a unique control on systematics, these two inference and measurement are in four and a half sigma tension with each other. This tension varies between four and six sigma depending on which probes you want to combine in the early and late universe. The two that I wanted to focus on on the bottom right plot is the blue point from the shoes team, which is the Cepi distance ladder, is precise to a bit better than 2%. And the green point is from six lens quasars by the Holy Cow collaboration. So this is using time delay distances to um, lens transients, an idea by Norwegian astronomer Schur Refstal in 1964. And the reason why this is interesting is that the Hubble tension could be a sign of new physics. However, before concluding that, we need to account for all possible sources of systematic uncertainty that haven't been accounted for by usual analyses, but also have different and completely independent competitive probes to measure H0 precisely. So for example, the luminosity distances for the local distance are completely independent of the time delay distances for the lens quasars. And that's something that I'll be talking about more. But before talking about um, the independent probes, I wanted to talk about how the local distance ladder actually measures H0. So the way in which the Hubble constant is measured by calibrating the luminosity of type 1 supernovae in the nearby Hubble flow, and that's the redshift range between 0.03 and 0.15. The reason why there's an upper limit on the redshift range is so that there is minimal dependence on dark energy parameters like the equation of state or like the dark energy density or in a more model independent uh, cosmographic expansion, the deceleration parameter. However, in this analysis, the deceleration parameter is a priori fixed with the value that is inferred from higher redshift probes. Now, what we wanted to do was not just take the, uh, the supernovae that are in this linear regime of the Hubble diagram, but to take all type 1 supernovae and simultaneously fit for both dark energy properties that are constrained by the typical high redshift anchored by low redshift compilations of supernovae, but also to have an absolute distance by a calibration at redshift zero through the Cepheid distance. And we wanted to see, is there any non-standard uh, cosmological model that would give us a different H0 from what is the fiducial value? And to what extent does that really come close to resolving the Hubble tension or to giving a different H0 from uh, the fiducial value? So the tension is typically of order nine to 10%. What is the shift when we don't assume the fiducial per, uh, value for the deceleration parameter? 
However, completely independent proofs have also reached a precise uh, uncertainty on the inferred value of H0. So Einstein's GR predicts that matter curves spacetime, and for a certain favorable alignment of a source and observer and an intervening object, we can see multiple images of the source. Now, this was proposed in uh, the early 1960s that using the delay between the arrival time of multiple images is a powerful probe of the Hubble concept. Now, in order to get that, we need a precise estimate of the time delay. So the cartoon figure there shows the, the light curves for the two different images. And this was originally assumed for lens supernovae, but has been um, made precise for lens quasars. And we also need a lens potential that is being modeled using high resolution images. Now, the Holy Cow collaboration with six lens quasars has measured H0 to 2.4%, and a completely independent estimate is giving an, agree, uh, uh, an answer that agrees with uh, the value from the local distance lab. However, there are lots of possible biases that we can test for, and that's why we want to find lens supernovae, because they have several advantages relative to lens quasars that I'll talk about when talking about IPTF 16 gu So before talking about that, I wanted to talk about a recent study that we did on looking at the role of dark energy in inferring the local value of H0. So as I mentioned, the local distance ladder estimate truncates the Hubble flow rung of the distance ladder at a redshift where uh, it is assumed that the Hubble diagram is linear. However, there still is an assumption on what the properties of dark energy are. So you can see on the bottom left-hand plot, we use all the supernovae from the Pantheon compilation. And along with Dylan Brout and Dan Skolnick, we quantify sources of systematics and covariances between the supernovae in the calibrator rung of the distance ladder and supernovae in the Hubble flow rung of the distance ladder. And by using that and not assuming something about the properties of dark energy, but just taking a series of different models, so like the standard lambda CDM, its phenomenological extension as WCDM, uh, modified gravity models like the biometric B1 model and dynamical scalar fields, as, as well as models that have sharp transitions at low redshift. What we see in the plot on the right hand side is that H0 is very similar for all of the solid lines there. So that shift is about 0.6 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec between the smallest and the highest. So that's about a tenth of the size of the Hubble tension. So it doesn't explain that for, say, if we assume something that's non-standard about dark energy, that it's not lambda, or we're just fitting for that with the supernovae, it's constrained really well. And what we see is that the inferred value of H0 does not change uh, very much compared to the fiducial lambda CDM. What we also see is that the type 1 supernova systematic error budget is about 1%, so 0.8 kilometers per second per, per megaparsec. And we see, and that's the difference we see between um, the dotted line in the blue and the solid line in the blue, which is lambda CDM uh, stat only and stat plus systematics. Now we see that while lambda CDM is not the best fit model and the best guy square we actually get for some of the transition models, and that's the brown line on the left hand side. We see that the, uh, all of the low redshift, like below 0.1 points, are below uh, or like um, 0.03 mag brighter. And that's because they come from very heterogeneous um, sources in terms of like the, the telescopes and the photometric systems and instruments and are uh, not a homogeneous sample. I'll talk more about that when talking about the ZTF sample and how we can circumvent possible unaccounted sources of systematics because they come from lots of different uh, photometric systems. And are we actually like favoring transition models or is this unaccounted systematics? Uh, that is something that we can test with a homogeneously measured sample. So before talking about the ongoing work with ZTF, I wanted to talk about the first resolved strongly lensed type 1 supernova. It's a novel probe, but it's not. It's completely independent of the local distance ladder. However, the question that comes up is, we have really well-studied lens quasars. Why do we want to study lens supernovae? And there are several reasons. For this. The first of which being, if we look at the light curves for lens quasars, they have very long-term monitoring with high signal to noise that's required to robustly get time delay. Whereas if we look at the typical light curves for lens supernovae, we see a very clear rise to a peak and then a decline. And Specifically for type 1 supernovae, they have a well-understood family of light curves and a well-understood SET. So we can get robust time delays without even needing very high signal-to-noise observations. 
Moreover, because their luminosity is standardizable, we can break modeling degeneracies like the Marsh sheet transformation. And because as a result, they can be discovered using their magnification, there is possibility of less bias from like high angular separation effect. In addition, uh, there've been several simulations that have suggested that there's a significantly lower impact of microlensing systematics on maximum light observations of supernovae compared to observations of Q, uh, QSOs. And I, as a result, there's several advantages to um, getting h naught robustly from lens supernovae. So what I want to present is work that we've done uh, on IPTF16GU. This was discovered in October 2016 by Gubar et al. And uh, the, the science paper is looking at broadband unresolved photometry. And the follow-up from um, the proposal by Ariel was uh, doing HST resolved photometry. Now, as we can see from the light curves in the six filters, there's not a lot of or no data around maximum light. And that's because this was discovered a lot um, later than we would have ideally liked in order to constrain the time delay really well. But also it's a symmetric system. So the time delay estimate itself is about one day. So even if we got an uncertainty of like 0.2 days, that would still be quite a large uncertainty in the final H0 test. So these are not the systems that we typically uh, expect to measure H0 precisely with. However, they're, they're very interesting, for example, to have like um, estimates of extinction in individual lines of sight. So you can actually measure each one of the images as if it's a separate uh, supernova and measure extinction properties to it. And by having robust extinction properties can directly measure a lensing magnification. Regarding time delays, I'll talk more about that in the search for lens supernovae with ZTF. We typically expect those time delays within ZTF to be about uh, 10 days. And if we can then measure that with 0.2 days accuracy as simulations of um, data like IPTF 16GU show, that would be a 2% uncertainty on the time delay. And that would be a subdominant error then in measuring H0. So for 16GU, we can very accurately measure the lensing magnification with uh, resolved photometry. So with unresolved photometry, just comparing it to a 1A template, the magnification was approximately 50. However, by getting extinction corrections in each one of the images, uh, using the multiband photometry from uh, WC3 and WC3 IR, uh, we can then pin down the magnification to be close to 70, and it's quite precisely measured. However, what we do see is that um, there is a discrepancy between the macro model predictions for the flux ratios and the observed flux ratios uh, of in, in the different HST filters. And while originally we thought that could be because of differential extinction, when fitting for differential extinction, what we found was despite that image one, which is the brightest image in the bottom right corner of the HST uh, um, uh, cutout, and image four, which is the one right above it, they still have a discrepancy of a factor of six between uh, uh, the brightnesses after accounting for extinction. So the next possibility was that while partially the difference is accounted for by extinction, uh, would there be like additional differential microlensing that can account for the difference? And by looking at stellar networks, this is work by Edward Motzel and Daniel Goldstein, they found that a combination of accounting for differential extinction and having differential microlensing with the different images, we can see that there would be uh, a uh, brightening of image one and a dimming of images three and four, and that would be consistent with the observations. Uh, and the probabilities for that was, uh, were uh, reasonably high. And that's interesting because then we can actually study things um, like uh, microlensing pr probabilities within a redshift point to galaxy and learn more about um, the properties of uh, the galaxy itself uh, from both the point of view of extinction and uh, microlensing. So while it might not be the ideal system for H0, we can directly get a, a lensing magnification as well as uh, microlensing probabilities and extinction pro properties. And that's something that, that's, that's quite interesting for several different reasons, like you can make an amplification spectrum of 1As and try and explore theories of gravity beyond GR. So for the second part of my talk, I'd focus on the Zwicky Transient Facility. So preliminary results from the Type 1E supernova Hubble diagram from the year one sample and the ongoing lens supernova search. So the Zwicky Transient Facility is a wide field optical transient survey on Mount Palomar at the 1.2 meter Austin Schmidt telescope. It has a 47 square degree field of view, which allows it to scan the sky 
at 15 times the capacity of its uh, predecessor, the intermediate Palomar transient factory. For type 1E supernovae, since it's uh, the main survey is a G plus R band search, on top of that, we have a partnership survey that looks at a fraction of the sky in the I band. We have three filter light curves for about 1,700 normal type 1E supernovae, and by normal, like spectroscopically normal, and ones that are like not showing any peculiarities in the photometry. This is 10 times the current literature samples. So in the bottom right hand side, that's the state of the art for supernova cosmology, and that's a little less than 200 supernovae at the low edge, below point 0.1. And the reason why this is uh, important and interesting is because when we see here, these supernovae come from a heterogeneous sample of different surveys, which are in, on different telescopes with different photometric systems and different instruments. As a result, cross calibration has a lot of unaccounted for sources of systematics, and that's a massive bottleneck in reducing the systematic uncertainty budget for both H0 and dark energy inference. So as it is out, having a large sample of supernovae on a single system minimizes calibration systematics. But additionally, it is unique that there is a single system for both search and follow-up. And as a result of it being targeted, uh, I'm sorry, as a result of it being untargeted, we can quantify the selection biases and minimize them by uh, restricting the redshift range or modeling whatever the small, system at, uh, small selection biases there would be as opposed to the current um, low redshift anchor, which is targeted observations using a different program from where there was discovery. So search and discovery on the same system is really important in order to control uh, the systematic uncertainty. Moreover, we find that we get, uh, we observe the supernovae significantly longer than the existing empirical supernova model for cosmology, but also the sample is distributed across the sky. So having a large statistical sample across the sky means we can also do directional cosmology. So like H naught, as well as like we can uh, in the future with like, if we have the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, Hubble diagrams in, di in different directions, we can also do directional dark energy properties. And that's something that's really important because as we see, if, even if we take a, a single Hubble diagram in 10 different directions, that's about 200 supernovae each. And that's roughly the size of the total sample that we have right now, both for calibrating, uh, uh, both for the low Z anchor for, for dark energy, as well as the Hubble flow down for the distance ladder. So the year one sample is uh, a total of 800 type 1 supernovae, 300 of which have already existing post-galaxy redshifts. These are critical in order to put them on a Hubble diagram. And I would like to emphasize that the post-galaxy redshifts are thing, uh, are, is something that we can get for survey and are doing in collaboration with the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. So uh, we will have like the full sample uh, once we have all of the redshifts. But already this year one sample that we are targeting is greater than the entire low redshift anchor currently in the state of the art. And it's all from a single system of search and discovery. Also, this data, as I alluded to earlier, extends beyond the SOL2 model. So that's the plot on the bottom left hand side. We see that the model stops at 50 days after maximum light, but the data go well beyond to at least 80 days. We have more nearby supernovae that go to 100 days or later. But we see that this is closer to our median redshift and we still have data that goes well beyond the model. Also, because they're caught extremely early, we can test novel standardization techniques. So typically type 1 supernovae are standardized for their peak brightness using the light curve width and color relation. But there have been a few studies in the literature suggesting that instead of using a single light curve width, we can have two light curve widths, one for the rising part of the light curve and one for the falling part. And this is something that we can only uniquely test with the kind of data on the left hand side, not on the right hand side, like the literature uh, uh, su supernovae, uh, where we don't have enough pre-maximum data and therefore uh, we won't be able to test whether or not that improves the constraints on the cosmology. Also the median redshift of a sample is about twice that of the literature sample. So we have a lower impact of peculiar velocity errors on our final uncertainty. So this is the preliminary Hubble diagram. We follow the regular procedures by fitting the SOL2 empirical model. Uh, we also find that like the errors on the model parameters, like the stretch and color, are predominantly are driven by the mo uh, intrinsic model covariance. So this data is going to be very important in order to improve the model in the future. We standardize the peak luminosity and we fit for the luminosity width relation, the luminosity color relation, and the intrinsic scatter. As of now, we're blind to all of the other parameters except for the intrinsic scatter, and that's 
to compare all of the different photometric pipelines that we have as of now. And once we zeroed in on which pipeline we would rather use, then we will unblind it and like, well, stay tuned because we'll have the final uh, parameter covari uh, covariances that, uh, that we put up. But what's interesting to see is that the sigma RMS is smaller than the literature sample. So we not only have uh, a smaller sigma RMS, but it's also going to have smaller uh, systematic uncertainties from selection biases, as well as be on a single homogeneous uh, photometric system. Last thing I wanted to talk about was the ZTF uniform depth survey with the goal of looking at slowly evolving paint transients like gravitational lens super depth. So this is taking a small footprint within uh, ZTF of 2100 square degrees, but going very um, deep relative to the main survey by hitting 20 and a half in G, R and I band. So this is the same depth in G and R, but it's deeper uh, quite significantly in the I band. But it also goes uh, deeper on stacked images. So using a novel image processing pipeline, it goes to a magnitude deeper uh, than the, the main survey. And this is work that's done by Danny Goldstein. We have um, follow-up uh, spectroscopy for candidate vetting from P60, Palomar P200, and Keck. And high resolution imaging that we've just got time for with Keck and the VLT. And that's uh, simulated light curves for Muse and uh, J-band with Hawkeye. Typical time delays, so at the median, are about 10 days as the bottom left-hand plot. And if we're able to measure as these simulations for the light curves show, uh, that the time delays would be better than a uh, like few tenths of a day uncertainty, that's going to be a subdominant uncertainty in the final inferred value of H0. So um, with that, I'll just leave my uh, summary and take questions.